Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, YouTube, WeChat, believe it or not, like it or not, uh, social media is how we're communicating in this day and age. And not just communicating with our friends and our family, but we attend. We buy, we sell, we consume, we watch, and we put our lives on the World Wide Web in one way or another. So as Sandra said, I'm Anna Bailey. I am the community chatter at Grassroots Media. So we're a small rural social media marketing company based here in the Manawatu. And my job essentially is chatting behind the social media scenes on behalf of a brand. Uh, I am engaging and connecting with audience. I'm ensuring that we're actively commenting, liking, question, asking questions uh, behind the scenes for a brand. And it's adding that personal element. So essentially, I'm your company's online external voice. A former primary school teacher and public health nutritionist, I'm really enjoying being connected with an industry that I'm quite passionate about again. So I thought I'd begin with giving you a bit of an idea on what the global social media landscape is looking like at the moment. So Hootsuite uh, completes an in-depth social media analysis on a yearly basis, and they are looking at both global and localised trends and coming up with some pretty comprehensive data on our digital uh, online behaviours. So as you can see, a world population of 7.6 billion, uh, there are 67% unique mobile users, 57% of the world are connected to the internet, and 45% are active social media users. There's 42% people, of people who use mobile uh, for their social media use. So year on year, they look at uh, the annual digital growth and they look at the change in these key indicators. And what this really shows is that while the world population, the use of mobile phones is growing, the use of the internet and social media is also showing rapid growth. Uh, with a 9% increase on both internet and social media users since 2018. And a 10% increase on mobile so social media users. So as connectivity improves around the world, you would expect that internet users and the number of social media users will follow those same trends. So here's what's going on in New Zealand, and what's really interesting is that of a population of 4.7 million, we have 6.35 million mobile phone subscriptions in New Zealand. So that's 133% of our population. And what I can put that down to is that people either have a personal phone and a work phone. We have 88% of our population are internet users, and 71% are active on social media. And almost all people use uh, their mobile phone to access their social media. So let's test this out in the room. Raise your hand, how many of you have a smartphone? And I would say that that's 100% saturation. Now, raise your hands, how many of you use social media regularly? So let's say once a day. Uh, so any of those platforms we talked about earlier, so uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp. Um, so that was close to everyone. Of everyone who didn't have their hand up for once a day, how many of you use it once a week? Cool. So I would say that probably you don't come to a social media chat unless you're um, probably engaging in it. So maybe we don't quite uh, meet the whole population target here, but. It also shows that we are connected. The rural community, we're connected with social media, we're connected on the internet. Now, this slide kind of blows my mind. So even though I am in a job where I'm on the internet, I'm on social media daily, in New Zealand, the average daily time spent on the internet on any device is five hours and 55 minutes. And the average daily time spent using social media is one hour and 43 minutes. So if this doesn't scream opportunity and um, the need to be there, then 
I don't quite know what does. So the second to last picture, the red one, that shows the average daily TV viewing time and the average time spent streaming music. So social media is a really great place to connect, to celebrate and to share what's going on in our primary industries. So also from the Hootsuite data, it shows that YouTube is the most popular platform in New Zealand, uh, closely followed by Facebook. And Facebook Messenger is the most uh, popular instant messaging platform. Uh, drop down to Instagram on 45%, and then Pinterest and Snapchat come in around 31%, followed by Twitter on 22%. So what about rural New Zealand? How do we stack up against our urban counterparts? So a survey of the current state of broadband usage of rural communities in the North Island of New Zealand was carried out in August of 2018. And so it's a shame that it doesn't have data from both islands, but it does give us an idea on what is happening in our rural communities. So this found that the majority of respondents were satisfied with their internet, internet connection and there was only 28% who sort of were dissatisfied and had problems. Uh, most respondents used their mobile phones followed by their laptops. And the reason that we're interested in mobile phone usage is that... Excuse me, this would be a lot of rural New Zealand that this is not happening. Uh, well, so this is suggesting that there's 28% have, have only got the problem. Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. But um, so, yeah, just from this from this one survey. But as as um, more and more connectivity programs roll out, then there's bound to be better connections. So hopefully, you know, this is something that they're looking at working on. Uh, so the reason we do look at, at mobile phone um, usage and, you know, why that is important is that um, when you're creating uh, content, you know, sending out newsletters, blogs, it's really important that you look at what it looks like on mobile first. So it's really easy to create things on a laptop or desktop, but it's, it needs to look good on mobile. So that's why that's a really important, um, inf important feature. Uh, another important, uh, interesting point that was found was that the rural community is more likely to buy online than to sell or to use the internet for business purposes. So maybe that's um, looking at opportunity. You know, we need to actually discover what is our opportunity for the primary industries there. And what are we using it for? Well, we're using it for email. We're using it for weather, the news. We're searching for information. But right up there, 62% of internet use for our rural communities is visiting social media um, sites and for instant messaging. And so that's slightly lower than the New Zealand average. It still shows that our rural audience is connected online and active on social media. So let's have a look at what makes social media so appealing. And what is the science behind this increasing trend? Well, social media platforms activate our reward centres. So when we receive notifications, likes, comments, shares, it taps into the very emotions and elements of the brain that make us human. So we saw above in the above slide that people are spending considerable time on social media, one hour, 43 minutes, right here in New Zealand. So it's a really powerful pull. Social media can gnaw at our insecurities and our addictions, but at the core of it, it is about the good. It's about seeing it in ourselves and recognising it in each other and passing it on. It plays right into our desires and our joys. So biologically, we have a hormone called dopamine, and that's a chemical in the brain that creates the feeling of pleasure and wants. And it's stimulated by unpredictability, by small bits of information, and by our reward cues. Pretty much the exact parameters of social media. The pull of dopamine is so strong that studies have shown tweeting is harder for people to res resist than cigarettes and alcohol. Oxytocin is released when we kiss, or we cuddle, or we tweet. So researchers have found that in 10 minutes of social media time, oxytocin can increase by 13%. And that's a hormonal spike equivalent to some people on their wedding day. 
and all the goodwill that comes with social media. Uh, all the goodwill that comes with social media, uh, with oxytocin, sorry, like lowered stress levels, feelings of love, trust, empathy, and generosity, well, that comes with social media too. So between dopamine and oxytocin, social media not only comes with a lot of great feelings, but it's also hard to stop wanting more of it. So why do we engage in social media? Well, we know that it plays right into the human emotions and our makeup. But first and foremost, it's a great way to keep in touch with our family and friends. My family have a huge amount of uh, people overseas and we rely heavily on the power of social media to keep in touch. It has a hugely positive effect. It's mean that we've meant that we keep in touch with a wider family network. Great Uncle Stuart lives in Bournemouth in the UK and he sees our kids on a regular basis and vice versa. And this is something that would never have happened 20, 15 years ago. Uh, social media is often the first port of call with the news. You know, news agencies are really good at breaking news and it's all on social media. As we mentioned above, the, the psychology of social media, it's all about that fear of missing out. So whether it be living vicariously through a friend traveling, uh, a new baby, a wedding announcement, it's all there on social media. And social media, it's our shop window these days. So while not a silver bullet nor a standalone strategy, from the stats above, you can see that if you are not on social media as a business, then you're being left behind and you're missing out on valuable exposure. And imagery and videos, they're a huge pull. They help us to shape a picture, form an idea on people, and we sort of build that relationship. We feel like we know people when we see them a lot on social media. So what can you do as an individual, a business or a brand to help positively promote what we do? Well firstly social media, it's a two way conversation. If you want people to stop and engage with what you're doing, then it's a really good idea to practice interacting with others. So as a business page, it might be taking the time to find other pages that resonate with you. Or going onto your business news feed and actually making comments and, and interacting as a person behind the brand. If someone comments on your post, it's a pretty good idea to reply. You want to be that person at the party who's interested and knows a little bit about other people, rather than the person who's always talking about himself the whole time. What makes people stop and engage is generally the personal moments, the behind the scenes insight into your business, the lighthearted look at something going on, celebrating success or the beautiful scenery that you have. In fact, we believe in a 4-1-1 recipe. So four lighthearted posts, one personal, po uh, one hard business push, and one soft business push. So if you're a cattle stud, it might be that you show us about your people and tell us about your people. Uh, you show us your favorite smoker spot. You push your upcoming bull sale. You take a picture of moving the stock. Drop in a sunrise or a sunset. And we know farmers love talking about the weather. So share your overnight rainfall and ask others what they got. Asking questions, it's a great way to get others involved. Be the conversation starter. Social media has the power to educate and get people excited about the industry. You never know who might be inspired or wowed. It's about being real and authentic. So I'm just going to go into a bit of an overview on a couple of different platforms and some um, primary industry accounts who we think are pretty cool. So if we look at Facebook first, uh, having good content is so important. You want to stop people scrolling to look at your post and you generally have one shot. Engagement is the number, number of people who click more, read, uh, react, comment and share your post compared to reach, which is the amount of people who see your post in their newsfeed. Having a large reach is good, but not quite as good as having great engagement. Uh, it is really important that your content is varied, you know, you sort of see some different things coming up in your feed. Imagery that is eye-catching without too much text on it gains way more attention than a post without a photo. 
However, video content generally trumps all types of posts. People find it easy to watch video and they like to sort of stop and see what's going on. Social media can be really egocentric. It's really easy to be all about you. However, it's important to connect with others, react and comment on their posts, curate posts from other pages that you like and share, share why. And don't be afraid to tag others in your posts. It's all about meaningful, being meaningful in your engagement with others, building your community, being real and sharing the essence behind what you and who you are and your values. So Applebee Farms Ice Cream are a great um, Facebook account. They always engage with their followers. Um, they always comment on their posts. Their content is fun. Um, they highlight their products really well, but they're always highlighting what's going on behind the scenes um, and where you might find their products, more importantly. Um, if you haven't tried this ice cream, I highly recommend the coffee flavour. Um, but yeah, they, they're, they're fantastic and there's not many, there's not many Facebook accounts who um, engage quite like these guys. I'd put them right up there. And I, I want more, so if anyone wants to start engaging, let me know. Oh, this isn't, we don't, we don't do these guys, but they're just, yeah, fantastic at engaging with us. Uh, Twitter has a great ad community online. Uh, it's a really fast paced platform, so tweets are loaded chronologically. Um, so that's where hashtags are really important. If you're using good hashtags on your tweets, then it's easy for other people to go and find, um, find your content. And likewise, if you want to search for, for anything, uh, search up a hashtag that you know has got a good one. Uh, so AgChatNZ is really good. Um, you can find any conversation that's got that hashtag attached to it and you can go and sort of catch up on what's been going on. And that is what Twitter is all about. It's all about conversation. So you'll find lots of people giving advice or asking for advice, asking questions, um, and just good general banter. Um, but yes, yeah, some really good uh, ad community on Twitter. Uh, so we love long, long bush free range pork. They have great video um, snippets of their day. Uh, highly entertaining. Uh, their videos are really, are really, really good. Um, and it's just a really authentic uh, feed about their, about their animals on their farm. So it's a really good insight into, into what they do. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's a bit of the commentary behind them as well, which makes them entertaining. So Instagram is your online storyboard. That's essentially where images are key. That's what's gonna stop people in their tracks uh, and get them engaging with what you're doing. Uh, Instagram stories, it's a less formal element of Instagram. Uh, stories only hang around for 24 hours and then they disappear. And this is where you can have a bit of fun. You know, share the behind the scenes. Um, you can ask, uh, set a poll, ask questions, and it is um, a really good way to engage your followers. People love seeing behind the scenes of a brand and it really creates that sense of relatability and familiarity and strengthens that brand awareness. So like Twitter, hashtags are really important, but being a visual platform, it's a really good idea to check out what the hashtags might also have behind them before you use them on your post. Uh, you never know what might be lurking behind a seemingly innocent hashtag. Uh, you can also follow hashtags, so uh, any, any hashtag um, will come up in your newsfeed regularly. So NZ Farming is a really good one. Uh, and like Facebook, it's another opportunity to genuinely engage with others. Create that sense of community and good feeling by commenting on posts and engaging. So Taylor Pass Honey have a really cool Instagram page. Um, they have great images um, and the images really tell a story behind what they do on a daily basis. Uh, it's generally accompanied with a short caption, but um, yeah, the pictures are what draw you into their brand. They also have a really strong Facebook page um, and yeah, they have an, some amazing videos. So they're a cool one to follow and keep up with. 
So another one worth mentioning are the um, on fun stories. So these are across social media as well as print. Uh, they're a Farmers Weekly initiative and they were launched in July last year. So far they've produced over 38 stories and they've reached 250,000 video views. So the reason that Farmers Weekly say that they went down this path was to help farmers feel better about the work that they do uh, and to help them tell their story. So it's all around provenance and integrity, helping our marketers to tell the world where our food comes from. Uh, another fantastic angle about the on-farm stories is that they're currently um, being shared in the agribusiness curriculum in secondary schools. So this is critical in highlighting the plethora of opportunities available in the primary industries. Uh, the analytics and the stats around each video are great on a weekly basis. Um, they get great reach and engagement and they're great exposure for the NZ farming story. Uh, so here is a clip um, of a recent on-farm story. This one is Harry Dallator, uh, a farmer from Flemington. Uh, his story reached around 27,000 people, um, was viewed over 7,000 times, and had over 60, 69 comments and 35 shares. For me, it's competitiveness probably. I want to be the top. I want to be right up there with everyone else. So you're constantly being driven to get out there and, and make sure things are ticking along and, and production is as high as it can be. You know, you've got your mates who are farmers and you, you're always having a bit of banter. You want to be doing things better than them. Not that I am. <laughs> I'm Harry Dallator and this is my fiance Kate and we're sheep and beef farmers in Flemington. We've got two and a half thousand recorded Romney stud ewe flock and about five and a half thousand commercial ewes. We've got a couple of hundred breeding cows. Depending on the year, we finish half of the stock and sell the rest store. Kate and I have been back here for just over five years now, probably running the place for about three of that. I always wanted to come back to the farm and be a farmer. I'm lucky enough to have a family farm which I can carry on the tradition of, of running. Since I've been back, every year has just been completely different. Yeah, it's challenging at times, but I can't really imagine where else I'd be. I definitely wouldn't have an office job. <laughs> back in the 60s, my grandfather had a vision of breeding a sheep which would be bred under harsh conditions and be able to perform well for a commercial farmer. A few years into it, him and my father thought they'd go down the road of breeding parasite resilient sheep. So no adult sheep ever receive a drench. The stud ram lambs go through a drench resilience program, which they're going through at the moment, with the aim to end up with about a third of them at the end of the trial that have been undrenched. And those are the animals that we're trying to identify and breed from further. Most of these lambs here will be going off to American markets where they are marketed quite well. GMO free, antibiotic free, raised out on the green, lush grass. And they are pushing that well over there and I think they are seeing a good response to the marketing. But that's a small portion of the market and a lot of people in the world. Sorry, that video was a little bit stilted. They're normally um, beautiful, uh, but he's had a really good message so I just wanted to carry that on. Uh, so they really are beautifully captured videos and stories, the on-farm stories, so um, they're produced weekly. So yeah, check them out. Uh, so just capping off, uh, a business or a brand should always have a plan behind their social media. Planning for content, uh, a plan for your message and a plan for identifying who your audience is. Uh, keep your content varied and interesting with great images or videos to help encourage that engagement. But my main point of the day is that social media is that two-way conversation. It's your online voice and you can join in the conversation or you can be the conversation starter. Uh, I love it when pages and people interact with our content, so if you want someone to practice in, uh, drop on by Grassroots Media. I'll see you there.
Uh, so very happy to take um, any questions. So what, what we'd like to do, if you don't mind, is just give you the microphone because we're videotaping um, the session this afternoon. So if the audience doesn't mind using the microphone and then we can get the questions on, on video as well. Hi, Matt Holden. I was just wondering, what, what were you using on your phone to, for your presentation? Uh, Google Docs. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. thank you. One end of the room to the other. Come on now, bro. Hey, look, um, that's good. Now I know that I should reply to some of the comments. But um, <laughs> hey, look, you, so you, Grassroots looks after other accounts and you do the replying and put posting stuff. I'm lucky I've got a niece that does that for me and it's excellent. But what I'm thinking though is you don't sleep or have a holiday or have you got someone you can play tag with? How do you do? Because it's 24 seven. So what's the game plan? Yeah, absolutely. And that is, is, you know, it's one of the traps that you can get into with social media. Um, so we do, we do play a bit of um, tag, you know, you make sure you have time out from it. But I think people have also have to realise that, you know, there, there is sort of that squeeze room, you know, so you do want to sort of be quite onto it with replying to comments and, and things like that, uh, especially if they're a little bit, um, or especially if they're niggly, then you kind of want to have a bit of a, a plan around that as well. Um, but yeah, that, just that general etiquette is making sure that there is a timely response. So yeah, we definitely do have a, have a plan around, you know, who's on, who's on what day and who gets a bit of time off. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you, Mark Warren, Central Bay. All right, I've got Derek's tag on to see if everyone noticed. Uh, uh, one of the things that's really interesting, an incredibly powerful tool, but is there a way that we can, can uh, own or retain the um, IP, intellectual property, or, or copyright a particular image? And the reason I ask that is I posted an image of, of cooking some nice chops over a big, big open fireplace and all the rest. And we have a girl at Contrante, a girl in America who, who runs Green Purse, which is a very clever situation. She messaged me, said, can I use that photo? Yeah, no problem at all. It cost the company $110. They reached 114,000 people in America. Now, I didn't mind because that's promoting our product. But all of a sudden, I thought, hang on a minute. You know, I've taken a photo. Somebody else commented me, to me that if I was to own that imagery, they would, even if it's 0.1% per share, all of a sudden, there's a little bit of cash flow out of that. So can you advise, if we take a magic photo that everyone wants to use, apparently in these systems, and I'm the pale male stale sort of addition that doesn't understand, but there's, there's cash flow to squeeze out of a very clever photo. So can you advise on that, please? Now, that would be the, um, that would be the question for Chelsea. She is our person who does more of that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not very aware on, on how you do own it because once it's on social media, a lot of the time it can just go. So unless it's you looking at it as the, it's being shared by you, or it's being shared on behalf of you and it's that snowball that, that gets that sort of exposure out there, um, I'm not really sure about the, the actual money that you can get behind Once it. Once you've let it go, you no longer own it. And I accept that, but yeah. something, we must be able to do something there to say actually that's got you right with it. That, that would be magic, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. That, that might also, you know, that might be a barrier for you know, for someone getting it out there, like if they had to pay, not sure. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I just take it as really good. Um, There's a thing on YouTube, is that once you reach over 17 people view it, you start tracking the ticket, how does that work? Yeah, so I think you have to have a lot, yeah, a lot behind that before you actually start, um, yeah, getting some money. 140,000? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so we've got another question over here that we'll just keep moving so we don't run out of time. Yeah, hi, uh, Harry Fars, Performance Beverages. Um, so, uh, so you sit there on behalf of companies replying to messages and things like that. So my question is more about how about cutting through the noise. So you had all the numbers on there, millions and people on social media all interacting with this thing, so you can sort of get lost in the noise type of it. So if you look, for instance, at 
you know, like for instance, Trump, he just says, oh, I'm going to do put tariffs on China and everyone's bloody liking it or disliking it or whatever. So he's sure, sort of using shock tactics to sort of cut through the noise type of thing is extreme case. But yeah. so, what I'm, so my question is, do you work with companies and say, hey, this is your target audience. So what kind of message can we create that grabs their attention so you, your likes go up or the amount of people that um, become a member of your page go up? Um, yeah, do you sort of, have you got tactics for that? Not always shock tactics, maybe. <laughs> not, not so many shock tactics, but it's absolutely knowing your audience. So, for example, if, if you, you're looking to go into China, you know, that's where you want to use that the clean green New Zealand image. But you're doing the same to go into Canada. They think they've got the best clean green image. So, you know, there it's about, you know, looking at completely different audience. So it's really knowing your audience and, yeah, what is it that they want to see? Um, so when you, let's say, so you have an image, let's say, nice image over there, people are, and so do you change these images and say, hey, they respond better to these ones than those ones, and also your, maybe your taglines or something, like oh, your titles, you say, oh, that works better than that, do you play around with that at all? Yeah, absolutely. So you're always looking at, at you know, what your audience likes. So I, what, another part of my job is doing a lot of the analytics behind a page. So it's looking at, you know, this went really well, hey, we should be doing more of this sort of content. Or actually, you know, they want to know more about our people. This, this was huge, got huge engagement. So let's tell them about our people because that's actually what makes a brand personable. Yeah, so yeah, you're constantly looking at what works and what doesn't. Hi, um, I, you've talked a lot about the positive aspects of social media, but I think that probably one of the key issues for the primary industries is the negative perception that happens on social media. So I think we see like Safe and Peter posting those horrible videos that we all see and they gain a lot of traction. I was just wondering if you had any advice for people on how to engage with those like negative people that are going to say your, you know, bad animal welfare, bad environment stuff because that is what is happening. Kind yeah. Of. So you're there. I would almost say we don't want to be engaging directly with them. Um, we've got our own community and we've got our own our own amazing stories that we can tell. And it's about, as I say, that two-way conversation. It's about building up our community and making our voice as strong as we can. Um, yeah, so in terms of that, I, I don't think we necessarily need to engage with them. Um, sometimes on your homepage, and you put content out and it gets lost, you know, um, how do you make sure people are seeing your stuff in their, in their homepage? Because you, sometimes you get like, stuff from three days ago comes up, and then yeah. the stuff most recently that you're maybe putting out, are they actually seeing it? Oh, and that algorithm, and they keep talking about the algorithm, um, it's, it is really hard. Uh, but th there, are, there are different ways, so if you wanted to, say, use an ad for, for really good content, then you can really look at your audience and target a certain audience. And they might be putting a little bit of money behind a post, um, or, it might be finding out what's your best day and best time to post. So eight o'clock in the morning might be great for one page, but it might be nine o'clock at night for another. So it's kind of giving, getting an idea around um, when to post and yeah, all that kind of stuff. How to beat the algorithm, that's a multi-million dollar question. Derek Daniel, I'm part of a small group in the Wairapa we set up three weeks ago. We call ourselves 50 Shades of Green. We're determined to fight this blanket forestry uh, that's coming at us because in five years' time there might only be half the number of people here. I mean, it's pretty serious. So uh, for our group, uh, we don't have $662 million of funding like um, whatever it was, uh, Greenpeace. Um, what uh, would you charge us to get our message out on all those uh, social media. How, how do you charge out? Uh, so it's just, it's on a, an account by account basis. So it's depending on exactly on what your needs are. Um, but I can give you our details and you can get in touch and yeah, we can have a chat. What numbers? <laughs> sure. Hey Derek, what colour is that? Green or grey? <laughs> Black and white for you, man. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? Anna. Yeah, 
um, I don't know, this might be a simple one, but how much is too much across the different platforms? Like, is there a limit that when you, you know, you're excessive and then people just switch off? Um, so sort of once a day on Facebook, um, three times a week to once a day kind of thing on Facebook. You, you want to be regular enough that you don't get lost um, and can, people can see that you're putting out new stuff. Uh, Instagram stories go mad. <laughs> um, Twitter, it's because it's so fast paced. Yep, go for it. Um, yeah. Any other platforms? <laughs> the, the, the main ones? Yeah. Hi, Dan Lynch, Overs Management. Um, just a comment, one thing we've noticed is that original content gets um, shared really well, but anything we pick up from someone else and pass on really doesn't get much coverage at all with the algorithms. Is that how you see it? Um, pro no, probably not from our experience. Um, we quite often make sure that we are curating a lot of stuff, so you know, sharing from other pages. Um, it, it could just be, I don't know, do you ask people, you know, tell people why you like it or, you know, that maybe we see a lot of pages that just sort of share stuff and there's no explanation or anything around it. Um, but no, you know, we love, we love curating stuff from other pages and sharing it, you know, again, about building up their community. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just do two more questions if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, William Beetham, um, farmer in Wairarapa and also Wairarapa Provincial President of the Federated Farmers. So we're dealing with a um, particular issue with a farmer um, in the Yapa Hutt area who is um, effectively being bullied through social media um, by, uh, I suppose, what I'd say, want to be environmentalists around, or an environmentalist around the outside of their farm. Um, what are actions or is there anything that an individual can take if they feel like they're being bullied in that particular way on social media platforms? Yeah, absolutely. So report anything straight away. So there's a little uh, little buttons to the um, right hand side of a comment, and you can report that sort of stuff straight away. And the more people that report it, that the more people you know, faster the action gets taken on it. But I'm pretty sure most platforms at the moment, especially, are pretty quick on you know getting on top of that kind of stuff. So yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's also um, the responsibility of you know whatever page that they're getting bullied on, to to be taking some action as well. Yeah, happy to chat about that more. If, yeah. Um, Annie Hoskins, I'm from the Farmers Weekly. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on organic posting on each individual platform, versus posting on say Hootsuite that pushes posts out across all of your different social platforms and um, the success of those posts, if it's um, posted organically rather than, I suppose, through those um, marketing platforms. So those marketing platforms, they are so handy. Um, we use one called Agora Pulse, it's, it's fantastic. But we, we absolutely write different content. It might be the same sort of thing, but it's definitely different for each different platform. So yeah, so Twitter is very different to what might go out on the same topic on Facebook um, and Instagram, for example. Yeah, so yeah, definitely um, different content for different platforms. Yeah. So we can stretch to one more question if someone's got one. Oh, come on. It's gotta be one. I was just wondering, I know that hashtagging is quite a big thing and stuff, but are farmers or the people that rural businesses are trying to connect with, have you got any like statistics as to how many people are actually using hashtags rather than just following pages that kind of get recommended to them? Um, in, on Instagram in particular? Yeah, or? and some people kind of seem to hashtag on Facebook, but I don't know if that's because I share their... Oh, don't Both? do that. Yeah, no, yeah I, I know. People do that. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, so absolutely. I think hashtagging does work on on Instagram because I think you'll find that you know you'll get people who are looking for something in particular, like NZ Farming, or um, yeah, and that's how well that's how we find a lot of our different um, accounts to follow. Yeah, so I think there's there is success there. It just depends on who you want to reach. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think one of the things that probably Anna knows and many of you in the room know is that I'm a bit of a serial tweeter. Uh, love Twitter, and I've actually converted my husband now, so he's a bit of a serial tweeter too. Um, so, yeah. But thank you so much. Um, the takeouts today are really, it is important that we use social media and do it in a really positive way. And I think um, you've given us some really good tools today. So thank you so much. So please accept that. <laughs>